I'm so thankful for the blood. How many of you are thankful for the blood? Why don't you lift your hands, lift your voices, magnify the Lord with me, Father, in the name of Jesus. We give you glory. We thank you for the great sacrifice, for the great exchange, your life for mine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Clap your hands again unto the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm so thankful the Bible says that through the blood of Christ, we have access unto him who is able to do exceeding today, abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Amen. Amen. I pray that through faith this morning, God's going to meet your need. Amen. Open up your Bibles and join with me in John chapter 16. And as you're turning there, I want to say how good it is to see brother and sister Williams. We've been praying for you all. Good to see them in the house of God. Why don't you welcome them this morning? Amen. Good to see brother Art Beasley, one of our elders in the house. Amen. Love him. Appreciate him. Praying for him and all that he's been going through. Isn't it great to be a part of the family of God? Amen. I'm so thankful to be a part of the church of the living God, to work for such a great man of God, our pastor. So I'm praying that you'll keep him in prayer this week. He is uh, experiencing times of refreshing. Amen. Amen. So I want you to keep him in prayer. Keep lifting him up before the Lord. God is doing a mighty work through our pastor. How many of you believe that? I know I believe it. Thankful for all of you today. Thankful for my family today. You know, as I look around, I'm just thankful that God has my family in church. How many of you are thankful to be in church today? I'm going to go to John chapter 16, starting at verse 32. The scripture says... Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. What a powerful message he just gave to his disciples who didn't fully understand everything that was going on but he said even though you're going to leave me and I understand that he said I know that God is with me today these things verse 33 these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world you shall have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world Amen. If you're thankful for that word, amen, that was a prophetic word to you and I today, I want you to lay down your Bibles and begin to thank God, amen, that he has overcome the world. He has overcome every difficulty, every circumstance, every trial that you may be in right now, every trouble that you have faced, amen. The word of God today is, is that he has overcome the world. Come on, somebody, give God glory and let's magnify the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you for what you're going to do today, God. Thank you for the miracles that have already been loosed into this house. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you may be seated. My title today is The Last Lecture. I borrowed my title today from a local professor who lived right here in Chesapeake. Randy Posh, a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, which is actually located in Pittsburgh, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and given only three to six months to live. He had just purchased his house in Chesapeake and was intending to move his family here. So, professors are sometimes asked to give lectures on what wisdom they would impart if they knew it was their last lecture. What would they say? But what he did not realize was that his last lecture would be something far beyond what would impact the students that he would be leaving behind. 
but rather what impact he would have on and what he would say to the next generation where his kids would have to grow up without him. Dr. Posh, a computer science professor, accepted the challenge once he learned that he had only three to six months to live. He said he hesitated at first, but then he went ahead with the lecture. And on September 18, 2007, his intention was to have fun and advise others to do the same. He spoke of the importance of a childlike wonder towards life, and it even entitled his last lecture as Achieving Your Childhood Dreams. Dr. Posh, however, did not omit things that would break just about anybody's heart. He spoke of his love for his wife, J.I., and he spoke of his three children, whom you see here today on the screen, saying he had made the decision to speak mostly to leave them a video memory to put himself in a metaphorical bottle so that they might someday discover it like you would a bottle on the beach. As the video of his lecture spread across the web and was translated into many languages, Dr. Posh also became the co-author of a best-selling book, which he entitled The Last Lecture. This book and this last lecture made him a Lou Gehrig-like symbol of the beauty and the briefness of life and drew the attention of the nation. And as of yesterday, his YouTube video was at 18,131,316,000 views. I would say he impacted a few lives. He posed a question to people all over the world. What would you do if you knew that you only had three to six months to live? And what he did, although it was education-based and scientifically based, he helped people to look beyond the non-essential things of life to see the real value that was missing from their lives. People testified about the impact of his testimony. They testified that he had changed their life. He had caused them to realize that their problems that seemed so great were actually very small. He said, if I had three words in an interview on ABC with Diane Sawyer, he said, if I had three words to tell the people today, it would be tell the truth. It was one of his greatest points of reference and in his message that he was leaving, not only to that generation, but to the generation that would follow. And he continued saying that if I was going to add three more words to that, it would be tell the truth all the time. Come on, somebody. As I close in on turning 50, I understand more and more the value of time. When I'm ministering in the jail to the guys in the reentry program, guys that are in a 90-day window about to reenter society that are incarcerated, I tell them that the most important thing you can do for yourself is be honest with yourself. Understand that where you are is not okay. Understand that where your life is at is not okay. Amen. Turn and tell your neighbor, you're not okay. It's the biggest lie that we try to sell ourselves because the reality is that life is often full of surprises. Life is unpredictable. You never know what's coming next. Can I get an amen? amen. And when we are and we will be, when we are faced with overwhelming circumstances or overwhelming odds that are not in our favor. It is at that moment that we have to decide how we're going to look at and assess our situation. And when you look at life from a human perspective, then you are going to view life through a very narrow lens. The human perspective is often bound by the someday syndrome. This is where we play it safe, where we settle for far less than what we were made for. Too many people's favorite day of the week is someday, Brother Lester. 
Someday I'm really going to live for God and get my act together. Someday I'll start loving my family more and put them first. Someday when I make enough money, I will spend more time with my kids. Someday when I retire, I'm really going to enjoy my life. But when will we wake up and realize that life is now? Amen. Romans 13 and 11 says, And that knowing the time, that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. When you look at the state of the world, when you look at where we're at, when you read the daily newspaper, I don't know about you, but I realize that today is our someday. I'm not going to wait, amen, for a diagnosis, amen, that condemns me to death to try to start living my life passionately and on purpose. Amen. I'm going to be very intentional today. Amen. To tell you that my last words, amen, are going to be of the hope that I have found in Jesus Christ. That my last words are going to be, I started to live when I learned how to die. Amen. My last words are going to be unto my kids that when trouble comes, look up unto the hills from whence cometh my help because my help comes from the Lord somebody clap your hands and give God glory so often it's not until too late so often it's not until we get so tired of waiting that we see so many now moments that passed us by But can I just say this morning that things are not going to settle down. Things will never, there will never be enough money. Come on, let me get a testimony in the house. Your kids will grow up. Today is a now moment. God did not design us to be, to stand by our lives like spectators, but made us to be partakers of his divine spirit that will enable us to overcome every fear and conquer every giant that arises in your life. When you look at the story of David and Goliath, it's a children's story to most people, but for me, it's a life lesson. You realize that Saul was right, that David looked ridiculous. If you would have been there that day, you would have thought the same exact thing. You would have said, don't be ridiculous, David. Be reasonable. That guy will tear you apart limb from limb. It would be like Rick Crouch against Kelsey Wilkins. Come on, somebody. Although I do like to poke that fuzzy bear from time to time. I don't know why I do it, but in Jesus' name, the grace and the mercies of God have been with me thus far. But Saul, he said amen. Did y'all hear that? Saul and the army of Israel were operating on the basis of reason. Where all you can see is how big your giants are. But when you are operating in faith, everybody say faith. Faith. Everybody say faith. faith. Say faith. faith. All you can see is how small your giants are compared to the great living God. When you look at life from ground level, giants will fill your screen. But when you look at life like David did, amen, through the God-level perspective, amen, it is through faith that he was able to conquer his giant in his life. Because my Bible tells me without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. I believe that he is. Does anybody believe that God is alive and well in Chesapeake, Virginia? Amen, on August 14th at 10 a.m. Come on, somebody. I believe that we must come to him with faith, believing that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
God sees your dilemma. God knows what you're going through. And he understands your frustration, your anger, and your weakness. Hebrews 4 and 15 in the Amplified Version says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and temptations, but one who has been tempted himself, knowing exactly how it feels to be human and in every aspect, in every respect as we are, yet without sin. One of the greatest attributes of God is found in Romans 5 and 8 when it says, but God commended his his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The book of Isaiah 59 and 16 prophesies and tells us that he saw that there was no man and was amazed that there was no intercessor, no one to intercede on behalf of truth and righteousness. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation to him and his own righteousness sustained him. Amen. God saw that we were in a sinful state, that we could not save ourselves. And my Bible says, amen, that he robed himself in flesh and came down and dwelt among us. Amen. Psalms 107 and 20 says that he sent his word down and he saved us from our destruction. Merle Ewing sang a song years ago that beautifully described this moment. He painted a beautiful picture. He said, on a balcony of space stepped a pure and holy God. In awesome solitude, he stood alone. Not one faint star to give him light. Just endless darkness and blackness of night. But somehow in the darkness he could see. He saw the mountains high and lofty. He saw the valleys lush and green. He saw babbling brooks and wildflowers grow. He even heard a robin sing. And then he felt a strange compassion, as close to love as pain could be. Standing out there in his tomorrow, he saw me. He saw me in his likeness. He saw me just like him, pure, clean, and holy, spotless, white within. Then he saw me bound in heavy chains and longed to set me free. But he knew if I became like him, then he must become like me. It's just like the songwriter wrote so many years ago that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but Jesus washed me white as snow. Are you thankful today for the blood, amen, that was shed upon a cross? Are you thankful today for a God that would see us in our state of brokenness and suffering and robe himself in flesh and give himself for us? Come on, somebody clap your hands and give God glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus was born to bear our cross. Hebrews 1 and 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2 and 10 says that, For it became him, for whom all are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. It's one of the things that we don't like to read about in the Bible. But even my, even the epistles of Peter say that after that you have suffered for a while, that God will strengthen, he will settle, and he will establish you. Amen. Your suffering has a place in your life. Your pain is there to make God an ever-present help in time of trouble. Hebrews 2 and 14 says, Therefore, since these his children share in flesh and blood the physical nature of mankind, he himself in similar manner also shared in the same physical nature, but he was without sin, so that through experiencing death he might make powerless, ineffective, and impotent. Amen. Him who had the power of death. Everybody say, that's the devil. 
and that he, through his sacrifice, might free all of those who through the haunting fear of death were held slavery to it all of their lives. I've come to tell you that God said today, amen, that you are free. God said today that no matter the situation or the circumstance, you have been liberated by the blood of the cross. His word to you today is, I have overcome the world. Somebody clap your hands. God himself decreed that the penalty for sin was death. God's own justice demanded that someone must die as a provision for sin. Hebrews 9 and 22 says, and they sang about it today, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Remission means the cancellation of a debt. It means the cancellation of a charge. How many of you would like to have some cancellation of some charges today and some debt? It's the cancellation of a penalty that should have been ours to bear. The penalty of the cross, the humiliation of the cross, the pain and the suffering of the cross he would bear. Romans 5 and 19 said, For by one man's sin, disobedience, by Adam's disobedience in the garden, amen, back in the book of Genesis, many were made sinners. And he said, So by the obedience of one, Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. What was so amazing is that about our God is that in the middle of this mess that Adam created, it was a mess of his own doing because he's the one that chose creation over the creator. He's the one that chose the world that God had created over the creator. It was in a place like this, a place of paradise, where he could not follow one simple rule, and it caused all of humanity to become separated from God. But it was at this same moment that God devised a plan to rescue his people through the power of his love. 1 John 4 and 9 says, by this, the love of God was displayed in us. Everybody say, in us. The work that God is going to do today is not going to be around us. It's not going to be by us, but it is going to be in us. In that God had sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That is the atoning sacrifice and the satisfying offering for our sins. And this fulfilled God's requirement for justice against sin and placating his wrath. This and only only this, the shedding of innocent blood would placate, it would appease the wrath of God. In our text today, I read to you the statement that Jesus made. It was his last words. It was his last lecture, if you will. And Jesus knew when he was telling his disciples that he was about to be abandoned by everyone he held dear. Amen. All of his friends and his closest companions would leave him alone. He knew what was coming. He knew about the suffering. He understood the shame. And yet still he prayed, not my will, but thy will be accomplished, O God. Jesus' last lecture was not just with words, but it was the word of God manifested in flesh so that God could demonstrate his power and his great love for us so that we could understand what the epistle of John would so write so many years later, that God is love. He defined what sacrifice was all about. He showed us how to deal with suffering and pain. He showed us how to bear brokenness, how to walk with humility, and even in the midst of great agony, to grant forgiveness. When he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
So many times we enter in and we get into places and we, we, we find ourselves uh, encompassed about by things that we wish we wouldn't have done. Things that have held us captive, that hold our imaginations captive. And we have a hard time seeing this great victory that Christ has purchased for us. Because Jesus' last lecture was the death, the burial, and the resurrection. John 15 and 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I've come to tell you, you are the friend of God. He laid his life down for you. He laid his life down for me. And I say that that is cause for great rejoicing. But though weeping may endure for a night, joy. It comes in the morning. Amen. I've got something to say to hell and the devil. Rejoice not against me, O oh mine enemy. For when I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, he shall be a light unto me. Hallelujah. He manifested his love for us in that he was beaten beyond recognition. Isaiah 52 and 14 says, As many were astonished at thee, his visage, his appearance was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. And yet in all of the pain and humiliation and the accusations that were being leveled against him, the Bible said he opened not his mouth. Come on, somebody, would God give us the strength on social media, amen, that when we are leveled through pain and suffering, amen, and accusations are being hurled at us, that we could open not our mouth and follow one of life's greatest lessons from the Savior himself. Imagine as he carried the cross and the, the weight of the wood beam that had been tied across his shoulder, gouging into his already lacerated skin, his muscles exposed from the scourging where they had beaten him with the cat of nine tails. Amen. I just wondered, saints. I just wondered, guest. I just wonder, friend, if upon that cross, if while he was being beaten so brutally, if he could hear that song, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I wonder if he could hear the song that we sang today. The blood, amen, that it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. Amen. I wonder if he focused, amen, not on his pain, but on the liberty that would be purchased by his great sacrifice. Come on, somebody, if you're thankful, amen, that God, amen, went to the depths of hell to redeem us so that we could have access to heaven. Somebody magnify the Lord Jesus Christ today <laughs> what's so powerful about the blood is that the blood would leave a trail for us to follow the blood that was pouring out from his body by now would lead us to a place of suffering called Golgotha, the place of the skull, where death had reigned from Moses up until now, according to the scripture. Amen. But now death would be swallowed up in victory so that we could stand up today and say, oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, grave, where is thy sting? Come on. He allowed us today to be able to stand Stand up and say, I am redeemed. Come on, some of us are locked up in failure. We're isolated by the mistakes that we made in our mind. And although we're here physically, amen, we're captive, amen, emotionally. Somebody needs to break out today and in praise and in the magnification of God. Let us magnify him together and cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me.
Because, my friend, it was in a garden as blood dripped from his brow that he prayed for a people. He prayed for Bible World Apostolic Church that we would believe on him by the word of the apostles. John 17 and 20 says, Neither pray I for these alone, not for the ones that were with him, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Amen. Through their testimony, through their last lectures. Amen. What would be their word? Words. And he said, I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. God's greatest joy and God's greatest passion, amen, is to pour out his spirit in this service and that you who are in pain and suffering, amen, who are afflicted and oppressed, amen, those that are bound by heavy burdens would come, amen, to the front and cry loud and spare not and say, Jesus, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Luke 24, it's the gospels that reveal to us his last words. It's the gospels that tell us about his life. It's the Gospels that paint the word pictures so he's not just a, an image, amen, that people will flow, throw up, amen, on a screen somewhere. It's not just about just a cross or the symbol of a cross, but it's about the sacrifice of his great love, that he did all this for you. He prayed for you as great drops of blood, the Gospel of Luke said, dripped from his brow. He said, I want to see Bobby Angelopoulos, amen, come to the front of this altar and bow his knee and cry holy. And as he prays me, praises me and magnifies me and calls upon his name because he's repented of his sins. He's laid his life down. He's opened himself up unto God, amen, that he might gloriously fill him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and just like the apostles on the day of Pentecost he's going to magnify God and speak with other tongues as the spirit of God gives him the utterance come on that's what it's about today it's about just one man one woman who can find him and experience the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ Luke 24 said that something had to happen he said unto them, These words have I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And this is the most important verse. The Bible said, Then he opened up their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. And he said unto them, Amen, now you're going to understand that thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day so that, amen, somebody say that with me, so that, so that repentance and remission of sins, amen, the remittance of a penalty, the remittance of a charge, the remittance of a death should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Yesterday, I went to the Portsmouth jail. While I was there, one of the guards asked me about my faith. God ordained this meeting. I didn't set it up. I had no plans on being at the Portsmouth jail yesterday. But God ordained a meeting. And it wasn't until after I got there that I realized what God was up to. While I was there, one of the guards asked me about my faith. And during the discussion, I realized that he had many of these types of talks before. So just like when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night to talk with Jesus, the Lord basically cuts off the conversation. He cuts it short, and he says to Nicodemus in John 3 and 3, except a man be born again, amen, he cannot, amen, I said he cannot see the kingdom of God. And what Nicodemus does is what we all do. He looks at the word of God and says with a human perspective. And Jesus answers, can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time? Jesus answers from a God perspective and says in John 3 and 5, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I simply challenged him. I said, I can tell that you've had a lot of these conversations 
I can tell that you've talked about this before, so let me just cut to the chase. Amen. You must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. And at that moment, when you repent of your sins, when you walk down into the waters of baptism, my Bible said you will arise to walk in newness of life. Is there anybody that has that testimony? If you have that testimony where you've been raised from the dead, amen, where God changed and turned your life around, would you stand on your feet and magnify the Lord with me? He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Keep standing. Just like David, sometimes you have to step out in ridiculous faith to see God move in a miraculous way. Sometimes you just have to step out in faith and accept the fact. Galatians 3 and 27 says, For as many of you as were baptized, amen, into Christ, have put on Christ. Amen. It's going to take faith today. Amen. To believe Colossians 2 and 12 that says that we are buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through faith, through the faith of operation of God. You have to have faith in the working of God, that just like God raised Jesus Christ up from the dead, he has purposed himself, showed up today in this house to raise you up out of your death situation. Amen. Whatever dilemma, whatever circumstance, whatever pain you find yourself in, my God is able. We all like to think that if we only had three to six months to live, that we would live them out with passion and a sense of urgency. There are people here today that have received such sentences. And have trusted God and turned everything around. Because when you trust him, it enables him to do the miraculous in your life. But Allison Krauss, she probably should have been named Crouch. But Allison Krauss sang a song that is all too true. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. You know, I'm of the opinion that if you're not willing to die daily, you're not going to be ready to die suddenly. So I've come today with the word from God, his last lecture. I've come today to tell you what he would have me tell you today if he were here himself. He would say, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. That the God, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the Bible said when they heard this on that very first day, that very first Pentecost, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And I'm going to invite you to do what I did several years ago. Peter said unto them, Repent, turn your life over to me. Because except you likewise repent, you shall all perish. There is no salvation without repentance. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall, turn to your neighbor and say, You shall, you shall receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For the promise today is unto you and to your children and to all them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And he's calling us today. He's reaching out to us today. I know that many of you have experienced the power of the new birth. You've experienced the death, the burial, and the resurrection by repenting of your sins, by by walking over to this simple, amen, brown, not, not, not amazing looking, amen, little water, baptismal filled with water. And you walked up those steps and you got down 
into the tank and, and you waited as the man of God gave you instruction and to hold your nose with one hand and with your other hand grab your wrist and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay you down very gently in the name of Jesus Christ. And when you come up out of that water, you're going to rise to walk in newness of life. So many people have seen their lives transformed. There are testimonies all over this building of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. People that were in drugs, bound up with addiction, with alcohol, that found freedom and liberty through the power of Christ. Amen. But I'm here today to tell you that the blood of Christ is in this place. Amen. That he shed his blood. And where the blood was shed, there came liberty and healing for every disease, from every sickness, from everything that we would suffer from. Amen. We would be set free. So if you need a healing today in your body, I'm going to ask the ministers to come and they're going to line up. Amen. The musicians are going to get ready to sing. Amen. Amen. That same song. Amen. That he tore the veil. Amen. He tore the veil. Amen. And he opened up the way for us to have access to him through the blood of Christ and through faith. If you need healing in your body, amen, I invite you to come and pray. Amen. Because God has loosed miracles into your midst. But if you've never, amen, repented of your sins and asked God to forgive you, then I implore you today, I challenge you today by my own personal testimony to step out of a life, amen, that's been unpredictable, a life that's been unfair, a life that's been bound with pain and suffering emotionally, mentally, and physically. And I want you to step out and say, Jesus, I lay down my life. I give it all to you. You can take this world. Just give me Jesus. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And as you begin to worship him, after that you've repented of your sins, God is going to pour out his spirit. And today you are going to receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Come on, somebody all over this building, go ahead and lift up your hands. Cry loud and spare not. Give it everything you've got. This is your life. Amen. That we're laying on the line. This is my life, and I give it to you, Jesus. I give it to you, Jesus. I give it to you, Jesus. Lord God, take my life. Hey. Yes. Nothing can separate you from his great love. the cross is where we find victory it's where we see the love of Jesus manifested toward us and that while we were still in sin Christ died for us yes hallelujah 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 yeah. oh yes you made a way Jesus when you said it is done oh he's ripping it open he's giving you the opportunity to have access by faith come on that's it by faith pray by faith seek him by faith call on his name yes this morning it is done it is done it is complete it is finished and you are complete in him in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus he's the head of all power he's the head of all principalities amen and in him the fullness of the Godhead dwells he is our hope he is our life he is our liberty in the name of Jesus.
Jesus. Come on, sister. Come on, sister, right here in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, for us. Go ahead and lay hands on her and say, it is done. It is done. God has completed it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hey. Yes. Oh, that's right. Sister Maureen, it is done. accomplished in the name of Jesus 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 yes oh I magnify you Jesus come on God is moving God is moving don't give up don't let this moment pass you by pray until something happens come on somebody push somebody push somebody push pray until God moves on you hallelujah the miraculous is yours the miraculous is yours receive it in Jesus name receive it in Jesus name when you say Amen. Just as our God raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, Lester, you're going to be raised in the power and in the likeness of the Almighty God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, the blood is flowing. The blood is flowing. The blood is flowing through this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, there's a young man over here praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. God is doing it right here, right now. God is doing it right here, right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, there is 
victory in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, yeah. It's power, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, come on, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for the work you're doing, God. Thank you for the work you're doing, God. Thank you for the power of your spirit that's been poured out this morning. I know many of you, I know many of you have places that you need to go. Brother Million, we have 5 a.m. flights to catch in the morning. But I want to say thank you for being in the house of God today. Thank you for trusting God today. Amen. Come on, I encourage you to continue to pr pray as they continue to play the music. Amen. Amen. God's not done in this house. But if you need to leave, we want to say thank you so much for being here. We love you and appreciate you. That same spirit that is in the house today will be in the house tonight at 6.30 p.m. We invite you to come back and experience the power of God as he moves in our service tonight. God, we give you glory and we give you honor. We thank you on behalf of Pastor and Sister Cunningham. We love you.